and gentlemen. <laughs> it's an honor to be here. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Oyebode could not be here. Um, you know, we've already talked about the passing of our friend, Mr. Deji Tinubu, and he, he witnessed it, so he's not uh, in the best frame of mind to be here. He wished that he could be here himself. Okay, great. So, um, I, I mean, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that introduction and setting the ball rolling. Today, um, we have been giving the topic innovation and skills for growth. So in terms of outline, um, we'll be talking about a few things. The pillars of innovation and skills for growth. So what are those pillars of innovation? That's, that's where it starts from, that's the structure. We'll also be talking about education and training as a policy. Right? If you're not making these policies, if you're not prioritizing it as policy, then it wouldn't trickle down. Um, we'll also be sharing a little bit about how human capital shapes innovation. All right? And then I'll be touching on innovation and skills for growth, just highlights on the China case study, what they've done and how it has brought growth to the economy. Um, in addition, we'll just share a few recommendations. So these will cut across recommendations that government um, could take or private sector um, in your case. And then, of course, a few key policy responses. And then we will go to the LSCTF story, which I know all too well. And I'm hoping that um, I can share with you. So without much further ado, um, the first slide would be about the introduction, which is the pillars of innovation. So when we talk about the pillars of innovation, there are four main pillars, talent management, investment and entrepreneurship, infrastructure and regulation, and of course, promotion support. So when you talk about talent management, it's about prioritizing career and technical education. And you know, as, as I speak, I want us to picture Nigeria and just really think, you know, let's contextualize what we're saying, you know. So for everything we're saying, the question to ask is, does this exist in Nigeria where we're operating? And if it doesn't, what do we need to do to then make it happen? You know, so because information is now, is now free. You know, you could go on the internet and get this information, but the issue is how do we contextualize it to our businesses and all of that. So in terms of talent management, we're talking about prioritizing career and technical education. I mean, we don't need to belabor the story of the fact that before in Nigeria, we had only three careers, so engineering, law, or accounting, right? Um, but now, I just saw a CNN article that said, that was talking about Linda Ikeji and said, from gossip blogger to media mogul. You know, that's something that would not have been celebrated before, but is now being carried by CNN. So, skills development and capacity building for MSMEs. We know, if you ask a typical MSME in these climes, they would ask you, they'll tell you that their first problem is access to finance. But perhaps not. Perhaps the main challenge is capacity, you know? And if you had the right capacity and you had been doing the right things, then maybe, just maybe, accessing finance based on the sources that are available would be a lot easier. Just something to think about. We'll move on to investment and entrepreneurship. So when you talk about investment and entrepreneurship as a pillar of innovation and skills, it's how do you support small businesses and startups through the provision of loans and grants. So there's a capacity side of it, which is the access to capacity, then there's the access to finance. Then we move on to infrastructure and regulation. So of course, businesses do not exist in isolation. In this part of the world, again, there seems to be a lot of self-regulation. So whether you're a business, an individual, you know, a multinational. Um, but infrastructure and regulation 
is a pillar for innovation. And some of the things to think about is how to improve regulatory, re regulatory policies to foster job creation. Are we thinking about this? Is it deliberate? And to also enhance the ease of doing business. Because it's one thing to have a great idea. It's one thing for your environment to allow you to actually nurture that idea. Some of the other things to think about is how to reduce regulatory burden and, comply and ensure compliance. All right, so are you paying your taxes as a business? Okay, and you know, do you even see value in paying your taxes? And I'm sure when we come to the LSCTF story, we'll tell you a little bit about what we tell our businesses um, to make them tax compliant. In addition, um, it's economic development and sustainability in capital budget in the capital budgeting process. So this is what infrastructure and regulation as a pillar for innovation looks like. The final pillar is promotion support. So you've created access to capacity, you've created access to finance. It would be nice to deliberately create access to markets because unless that business genuinely grows and expands, they will not be able to repay their loans. And I think that this is where the promotion support comes. So are you giving them an opportunity, assistance to access foreign markets, for example? Do they have the right capacity again to do that? You know, so because a lot of these things, even information can make a difference um, in terms of assistance. Collaboration, of course, within agencies to increase export, and then finally, intensify global innovation and collaboration amongst MSMEs. So now we move on to education and training policy, a key to ensuring young workers have the right skills. Mr. Chairman then highlights some of the unemployment numbers, and I don't know if we know them, but uh, they're very, very troubling numbers. Um, so based on the Niger National Bureau of Statistics Q3 report, Nigeria today in terms of unemployment and underemployment at 41%. I'll allow you to do the math in terms of how many millions of people are out of work. And then when you talk about the youth unemployment, un unemployment and underemployment ratio, um, ratio, that's even worse, it's 52%. Okay, and these are people who are restless. These are people who, you know what can happen um, if those energies are not uh, managed. So in terms of what we can do, we can invest in education and training for an automated world. It's happening. You know, the interesting thing about this thing is whether you like it or not, it's going to happen. And that's, that's just what's interesting about it. I always say, when I travel abroad, I tell my friends and my family, I say, what's annoying is that they're not even stopping for us to catch up. They are constantly just moving, right? So we have to start training people for an automated world. Who saw the Amazon um, supermarket that now has no human being? It only has a human being at the alcohol area to check, check the age. But otherwise, you're going through a supermarket by yourself. This is the world. It's real. They are using robots now in production. This thing is happening. It might not be happening close enough for it to be our reality, but you need to plan for it. Career development and retraining support. So the need to ensure career advice. You know, we can't just, I mean, we don't want to talk about our tertiary institutions, but a lot of people will tell you who try to hire that we're just churning out, you know. I mean, they're the ones who can't even go, but the ones who even make it in. The question is, what is the quality of these people? So career advice, do you know the truth? There are always jobs. It's a sad truth, but the question is, are there people who are skilled to take up the jobs? If I ask the employers in the room if they have vacancies, they will tell me they have. 
the question is, can they find people who have the required skills to fill those job vacancies? And so there is a need to ensure that we advise our youth. The final point will be to invest in the digital sector to create new jobs. Again, that point cannot be overemphasized. Moving on to how human capital shapes innovation. There are a few ways that human capital can shape innovation, um, and I'm going to highlight five of them here. Skilled people generate knowledge that can be used to create and implement innovations. So you have to be skilled. You have to be exposed to it. I hope, I'm just hoping that people are not still studying computer science and not having access to computers. I just hope, because I don't know anybody in school now to ask. But if, if you don't, if you're not exposed to the knowledge, then there is no way you can actually use that knowledge to do something. I mean, we know the story. There's a gaming, there's a young man who Mark Zuckerberg recently invested in who just used to play game. But when he's playing the game, he will be manipulating the thing and saying, can't he do this and that? He, was, he knows the possibility and he has used that to innovate. The second point is having more skill raises the capacity to absorb innovation. And the, the simple example to use is mobile phone and our older parents, right? The truth is any old person that wants to learn how to use Facebook, Instagram, they can learn it. It's the truth. But if you don't want to learn, doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And it doesn't mean maybe your friend is not using it to connect to your other friends and that you could have been a part of that. So just having more skill, right, gives you the capacity, all right, to be an early adopter and not a laggard when it comes to innovation and technology. So moving on, point three will be skills interact synergistically with other inputs to the innovation process, including capital investment. Again, that is a very simple point. You know, if you have skills and you have the right mechanism, you get the right capital. Sounds simple, but it's complex. But if you have skill, this is easy. Point four, skills enable entrepreneurship, and entrepreneurship is often a carrier of innovation and structural change. The point is very simple. So oftentimes with entrepreneurship, you start a business, you're doing it, you're doing it. Perhaps one day you say, you know what, let's do it differently. That's innovation. So having skill enhances entrepreneurship, and entrepreneurship in itself would constantly lead to innovation because people have to think, oh, how can I do this differently? Or oh, maybe, maybe we should try this. Perhaps we should try that. And what happens in essence is the economy benefits. The final point with that skill users and consumers of products and services often provide suppliers with valuable ideas for improvement. So very similar to the last point. It's a reiterative process, you know, so, oh, what did you like about what we did, our product or our service? What can we do better? You take that information and perhaps it leads to do this differently. So you have innovated in the business. So this is how human capital can shape innovation. Now we move on to how human capital com contributes to economic growth. We were already inferring it in how human capital contributes to innovation, but more specifically now. There's empirical evidence that shows that the direct contribution of human capital accumulation to long-term output growth. So there is empirical evidence to show this. So there's no argument about that. The issue is, are we building our human capital to deliver to this? The next point is that there is a positive correlation between the development of human capital 
measured by increase in educational attainment and skills, technology adoption and innovation. Just think of China or the Asian countries. I used to work at Samsung. In Seoul, there's a hospital, a Samsung hospital that has no human being. You cannot be, in short, let's not, to think about Dubai. I will not lie to you. I can't remember what year I went to Dubai for the first time, but I'm telling you from the bottom of my heart, my faith in God increased. I said, you mean a man, human, thought about this? Ah, God, I've been underestimating you. The Burj Al Haram defied everything, physics, everything, chemistry, everything, gravity. You can't be innovating and remain the same. You must be growing. So there's a correlation. It's clear. The next point is that a low level of educational outcome and skills, which is our case in Nigeria, is one of the major constraints to the country's economic development. And I'll let the economists in the house, you know, debunk that or, you know, but that's the truth. The challenge, the skills, we're not, we're not innovating. We're not even allowing our people to think. Who is coming up with new innovation in the different areas across sectors? Or perhaps they are. You know, we don't appreciate indigenous knowledge. I, you know, here and again in the newspaper, I come across a guy in Ajegunle, you know, develop this using tires, but he does not have the visibility to then attract maybe the funding to scale that for it to become an actual business. But the difference between other people and us is in other countries is deliberate. They look for that guy. They support him. They give him the right infrastructure, the right access to finance. He creates jobs and he becomes even a product for exports. A better trained labor force coupled with increased adaptation of technology and imp will improve the productive capacity and competitiveness of the economy. So just what I said. Countries with more inclusive and better human development outcomes have higher literacy rates and longer years of schooling consistent with higher income per capita and relatively longer life expectancy. Again, the point cannot be overemphasized. These things are all related. So with our low quality of education, you can sort of do the whole spectrum of what then happens and what the outcomes end up being. Finally, on the how human capital contributes to economic growth, achieving the economic diversification agenda of Nigeria will not be possible without an improvement in the skilled workforce required to move the economy up the value chain. It will not be possible. So regardless of how we talk about diversification, where are the people? Have you trained them? Are they ready? These things have to be deliberate. So let's just take a look at China and some of the things they did. So China adapted a university industry cooperation um, what that would look like is very simple so there are people in school all right so you're studying mechanical engineering for example and the, the people last year used the curriculum right but the people in the industry so the organizations that are providing mechanical engineering services based on their clients problems have now realized hmm we need to find a different way to do something. Now, if there was a cooperation between industry and the educational institutions, they will go and sit with the professors in the school and say, you know what, this part that you used to teach, something has changed. It didn't quite work or it worked, but we think we can tweak it. Can you maybe do a challenge and let your students you know, try this thing, or perhaps this information needs to change because something out there has changed. So this was deliberate. The partnership between industry and the educational institutions. 
So that's one of the things that China did. Because again, back to my earlier point about vacancies and people to fill them. It means that there's something you want, you're looking for that the person doesn't have. But perhaps if you were already engaging with the schools and saying to them, we would need this skill. Can you ensure that you nudge them in this direction? Let it not be outdated when they come out. That's what we're saying. Something else that China did was, of course, partnerships with universities and other types of organizations through a systemic and synergetic approach to employer engagement. And so they also contributed to the curriculum. So even in the curriculum, they were innovating. Ah, I have a long way to go. God help us. China moved swiftly from the phase of elite higher education to mass education. This, this, it has to happen. It's not about whether you went to private school or public school. The issue is what are they doing in the school? And then finally, there was emphasis on vocational education. So <laughs> I know that um, <laughs> we will come and talk about this thing. You know, when we first started thinking about employability, I, I kid you not, but the first thing we thought about was actually rebranding blue collar workers and the perception that Nigerians have. We thought we needed to do a, a, a campaign, a communication campaign, to let people know that, see, your driver, or oh, I don't know what to use, they are building houses, oh, these jobs are not bad. But because you feel I'm a university graduate, and you are looking for a job one year, two years, three years, you are not becoming an entrepreneur, nothing is happening. So technical and vocation, if you, if you look at these countries, look at Asia, technical and vocational education, it's not theory. What can you do? What can you do? All right, let's quickly move on to the recommendations. So it's important to understand the big picture. All right, pay attention. Understand how technology is developing and what the mega trends could mean for the world and for you. Two minutes, okay. <laughs> Expect the unexpected. I think it's the same point. So ensure that you're innovating, you're paying attention to the trends, but just don't stop there, take action. All right, plan for an automated world. We already said that. Now, think about it. Even though the world is automating, and I just told you about Amazon and a supermarket that was, there was no human. Who worked on the technology? Is it not humans? Exactly. So it's just that you need to now change the skill that human beings are getting. All right? Key policy initiatives will be promote a broad variety of career pathways improve vocational education and STEM education. We already talked about that. And engage employers in training strategies, which is what China did. So now let me quickly go into the LSCTF story. Um, so the Lagos State Employment Trust Fund uh, was instituted by law, and we have a very clear mandate to create jobs in Lagos State. Um, and we're doing this in four major ways, entrepreneurship, employability, promotions, and interventions. Under our entrepreneurial program, it's very simple. So you see all those things I was saying in the beginning. I mean, with all modesty, I'm proud to say that Lagos State is doing it. So we're providing access to finance, we're providing access to capacity, and we're providing access to markets. So Lagos State Procurement, National Export Promotion Council, we're working with them to ensure that our beneficiaries can export, can participate in the Lagos State procurement process. It's deliberate, okay? So to date, we've disbursed about 5,500 loans um, to the value of 5 billion Naira. So you can go to our website, just because we don't have time, it's lsctf.ng, but you can access from 250,000 to 5 million Naira at the lowest interest rate you find in Nigeria, which is 5%, we do not take any collateral or social collateral, which is find one guarantor if you're a micro enterprise or find two guarantors if you're a small business. 
So I've talked about, in terms of interventions, we deliberately ensure that we engage the government agencies to ensure that there's ease of doing business. And uh, finally, our employability program. This is a program that we're collaborating with the UNDP on to train 10,000 people. And what we've done is very simple. What are the sectors that have high growth potential? We've identified those sectors. We've engaged the industries in those sectors. We said, what are the skills you're always looking for? How can we help you? What do you want to see? And we fed that into a curriculum that is now sort of being used to train the people. Um, I think that's it. OK, great. So finally, I'll end with a quote. Um, it says, we should remember that intellectual complacency is not our friend and that learning not just new things but new ways of thinking is a lifelong endeavor. Thank you very much. <laughs>